Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. Before presenting Monsignor Angelos, the Bishop of the Coptic Orthodox Church, I would like to say a few words. Uh, I'm, my name is Alexei Komov. I'm a Russian. I'm from Moscow. I work in the Patriarchal Commission of the Orthodox Church in Russia. Uh, it's the Commission for the Family, just like Palia in the Vatican. And I am also uh, the head of a think tank. And I would just like to say that in Russia, during the 70 years of communism, we have had a situation uh, which was terrible with the strong persecution, great persecution of the church. And at the time of the Bolshevik Communist Revolution, over 80,000 churches were present in Russia. But after 20 years of aggressive communism and uh, their attacks against church, there were only 100 churches in this enormous, enormous country. But we have uh, experienced a miracle over the last 25 years since communism, and we have a great rebirth. We have seen the renaissance of Christianity, spirituality, and religion in Russia. And over the last 25 years, we have rebuilt or constructed over 30,000 new churches, 30,000 in Russia. Eight hundred new monasteries in Russia we now have, and we also have new laws against abortion and against abortion propaganda, which is in completely forbidden in Russia, including aggressive uh, advertising or publicity to young people with, uh, with regards Uh, homosexual lifestyles. The number of abortions in Russia stood at 4 million per year 25 years ago, and now we're talking about five times less that number. And there are positive demographic trends in Russia with traditional values, traditional Christian values and other traditional religious values. This is something which is something really basic in Russia now. This is a miracle after 70 years of persecution. And I think in the example of Russia, I think of the example of Russia as a very important example when we talk about the situation of persecuted Christians in the East. And there is hope. It is possible to change things. And I think that it is very important to all of us uh, work together, Catholics, Orthodox, the Coptic, all Christians, in our spiritual battle to defend the rights of Christians because Christians are the most persecuted group uh, on the world. In the world over the last 2,000 years of history, we have the mass media and politicians who do not say anything about this. And so I think that this conference that we have here today is very important. And now I would like to introduce Monsignor Angelos, Bishop of the Coptic Orthodox Church. Thank you. Good afternoon. It is a privilege to be here with you today, and it is an honor to be amongst so many people who think beyond themselves 
and beyond their own geographical position. But people who think of others who may be many thousands of miles away. I'm also very thankful for this initiative. Ever since the Noon initiative has started, um, some of you will know that it has been on my Twitter profile, and I intend to keep it there. Because we all do go back to very particular roots and a very particular heritage and particular origins. Christian witness, as we see it today, is incredibly important. Because unfortunately, the general media coverage of religion, and particularly sometimes Christianity, is quite harsh and quite negative. If we were to look at the media, we would expect to believe that we are bigoted, self-interested, weak, corrupt, and very hypocritical. But we know that that is not the truth. There are elements among us that are weak. We ourselves, in the brokenness of our humanity, are sinful. But there are many who still live today and still witness very faithfully, very honestly, for their faith, for their belief, and they do it even unto death. Within my own church, we have a tradition in every liturgical service that the Synexarium, the Book of Saints, is read just before the Gospel, where we look at the lives of those who preceded us, and we look at the sacrifices they've made, the contributions they've made, the lives they have lived, as an inspiration to us. But for many of us, we've been desensitized. For many of us, that has been a thing of the past. People died hundreds of years ago. People lost their lives for their faith generations ago. We hear of horrific persecution, torture of our saints and our martyrs centuries and generations ago. But what we have seen over the past years, and particularly over the past months, has brought back to life the fact that martyria, witness, even unto death, is a part of our lives even today. And we here speak of it from a distance. But there are some among us who represent people and who live among people who actually live it on a daily basis. While it is a beautiful witness, while it is a powerful witness, it is a real indictment of where we have arrived today as our community in our world. It is a real telling of what our priorities have become and what the world has taken us to. Many of us speak of religious freedom, international religious freedom, human rights, and we speak of it powerfully. And we speak of these things as manifestations and even creations of man-made laws as present in human rights rulings. Whereas actually, these are God-given. We are born free. We are born to choose. We are created in God's image and likeness. We are loved and valued equally. And law is only really playing catch-up with God in enshrining and formalizing in treaties and agreements what God has given us as humanity from the beginning. God wills us to be free. God desires our freedom so that we can choose him. Because a forced faith, a forced belief, a forced choice is no choice at all. And it is a fallacy of belief. 
We come together at incredibly difficult times. Now, in perspective, my church, the Coptic Orthodox Church, has lived one form of persecution or another for the past 2,000 years. And in particular, since the 7th century. And we still do until today. Yet, we are not victims. We are just those who face persecution. We are those who face the challenges and obstacles that we are warned of. This is wonderful, but the reality of the situation is that 2,000 years after our Lord Jesus Christ walked on those same lands and his disciples went to those same lands, that our brothers and sisters there are suffering. Statistics will tell us that 30 years ago, the Christian population of the Middle East was about 30% of the overall population. Now, there are some statistics that will say the, that presence is as low as 5%. That in itself is tragic. But if you look numerically and realize that of that 5%, 12 million live in Egypt as Egyptian Christians, they constitute four of the 5%. So actually, in some parts of the Middle East, the Christian presence has fallen to 1%, and sometimes even less. I have challenged time and time again people and thought that if this was happening, this very situation was happening to the indigenous Indian population of North America or the indigenous Aboriginal population of Australia, the world would not have been silent. But having it happen to the indigenous Christian population of the Middle East puts us in a different category. You see, I think we need to stop speaking of minorities. We in Egypt reject minority status. In the Middle East, we reject minorities. We're not minorities. We are indigenous people. These are our homes. These are our lands, whether it be in the Palestinian territories, in, in, in Iraq, in Syria, Libya, throughout the Middle East. We are a numeric minority, without a doubt. But as a status, we have been there. And by God's grace, we will continue to be there. But this freedom that we have, that we have here today, within this gathering, with these people, you, as faithful advocates, this is what we share, not only as a privilege, but as a responsibility and an obligation. Because it is up to us to speak the truth. As a Christian, I am told that the truth will set me free, will set us free. And there is only one truth. That truth is our creation, the image and likeness of God and God's respect for that humanity, all of humanity. Egypt has become much better. And so I sometimes feel guilty of being asked to speak of Egypt at gatherings like this. But I'm not just an Egyptian Christian, I'm a Christian. I don't just advocate for Egyptian Christians. I advocate for Christians, Muslims, Yazidis, atheists. Because if we are to accept the words of our God who created us, this is all his humanity. And we are entrusted as the sons and daughters of Adam and Eve over that humanity. I cannot, 
and I'm sure neither can you, find comfort in the fact that my Christian brothers and sisters may be okay, but that their Yazidi neighbors are being persecuted because we're fine. Well, we can't be. I've been asked in the past, and my view is, that would be the most unchristian thing I can do as a Christian. And this is why we're here. When we say we are all noon, please don't look at Middle East Christians as victims. Don't want to be associated with them as victims. Don't look at them with pity. When we say we are all noon, it means we're all powerful. We're all witnesses. We are all martyrs. I personally have a huge issue with the term martyr these days. It has been hijacked. It has been used so despicably. It has been used to actually stress the killing of others. Whereas the martyr within our tradition, historically and currently, is the one who pays the ultimate price for his or her faith, even unto death. Egypt, in August of 2013, was suffering a very difficult time. The then president, Morsi, was removed. His followers had a demonstration in the center of Cairo to have him reinstalled. The vast majority of Egyptians, Christians and non-Christians alike, rejected it. But his followers were insistent. And when the army dispersed this gathering, and hundreds of those followers died, and, and please believe me when I say to you, my heart sorrows and agonizes for those people who died, even if they're jihadists. The heart of a mother, the heart of a child, the heart of a sibling does not grieve differently when their son is a Coptic Christian or a Maronite Catholic or an atheist or a jihadi. And it is such a waste of life. It is such a waste of that presence. And as Christians, one of the most difficult things we have been asked to do by our Lord Jesus Christ is to love our enemies. Now for us, for many of us, that has been a theoretical formula for many years. Now it's time for us to live it. And we see so many people actually living it. In Iraq, ministries that look after everyone. In Syria, likewise. In Libya, in Egypt, around the world. In Nigeria, in Kenya. In Pakistan. Where there is a presence and witness of Christianity that stands for all. During that time, we suddenly had an attack over 50 churches and 50 other places of Christian ministry in 48 hours. I was interviewed at the time and asked whether I thought it was orchestrated. And my answer is, I hope to God it was. The best case scenario is that this was orchestrated. Because if it wasn't, it means that every Muslim in Egypt wants to kill every Christian at the, worst, at the first possible opportunity. But the proof that it was orchestrated was 40 hour, 48 hours later, when the Christians did not retaliate, it all stopped. The plan, according to many who know better than I, was that if you attack the Christians, they fight back, and when they fight back, you create unrest, and then you can bring back the deposed president. One very important point is that in all of those attacks, imagine, imagine if 50 churches were attacked anywhere in the world and 50 other places of ministry anywhere in the world, any places of worship of any religion. The miraculous thing was 
there was not a single act of retaliation, not one. Not one act of retribution. And I always make a joke of saying that there was no memo that went out. No one sent out a message from head office saying, please don't retaliate. It's what Christians did instinctively. And it is through that non-retaliation, that peaceful reaction, that that cycle, that spiral of anger and violence was broken. Likewise, just a few months ago, we've been seeing pictures on these screens of those 21 men paraded on a beachfront in Libya. Paraded not as humans, but paraded as war trophies. Paraded in a dehumanifying, in a way that, that diminishes their presence. But in actual fact, this very polished video, and my concern from the beginning in speaking to people was that it was so polished, it was so produced, was supposed to instill people fear in people's lives, in their hearts. But what did it do? It actually empowered people. They saw that in this day and age, today, as we sit here in this room, a few thousand miles away, men who never started out to be martyrs. These were poor men from a poor village who went all the way to Libya to work to support their families. That's all they were. They weren't heroes. They probably weren't necessarily very religious. They were just people. Yet, when it happened, they became martyrs. It's astounding. These men, as they walked along the beach, and there were so many theories, they'd been drugged. Well, they couldn't have been drugged because they were walking with such dignity. They thought that it was just a rehearsal. I would think that once the blade starts to cut through your skin, you realize it's not a rehearsal. But what did they do? They witnessed. They proclaimed, not with shouting, but with calls to the Lord. I serve young people, and so I always tell them to look at the difference between them and their grandparents' generation. If you cut your finger, some people may call on a saint if they're of an older generation. This generation, some would actually say some sort of profanity. Imagine these men were being butchered. Not one of them insulted one of his murderers. How does that even happen? Not one of them said a profanity. Not one of them swore. I mean, you're dead. What have you got to lose? Make a point. Make a statement. Curse. Swear. The only thing that came out of their mouths was a call to their savior. Now, this video that was supposed to instill fear in people's lives and hearts became such a witness because these words of calling on Christ in the midst of this crisis that they thought was an insult was actually their greatest victory. We just came out of Holy Week. We just came out of the Golgotha journey. We just came out of visions of our Lord carrying his cross. And these men, along that beachfront, carried their cross. The cross that was a cross of shame, a cross of execution, they were taunted. They were ridiculed for being those of the cross. But that cross became their glory. As St. Paul tells us. So today there is still a real witness. But we have a responsibility. We have something we must do. We have to look at people like these 21 men, 
like others killed in so many places, and consider as Christians how we look upon the violation of their humanity and their freedom. What do we do about that? There's a harrowing statistic, and that is that 73% of the world's population still lives in countries where there are human rights violations. 73%. At a time when almost all of those countries have signed up to international treaties, international agreements. Where is our position in this? As Christians, we are called to continuing to be a moral compass without self-righteousness, without triumphalism, but powerfully. To be powerful advocates to the powerful truth. And as humans, we are called to do the same. Surely, if we all share in the image and likeness of God, then there must be a part of us within that yearns for that truth. Christians in the Middle East, whether in Egypt or Iraq or Syria or Libya or the Palestinian territories, anywhere, are a stabilizing and reconciling force. Their presence is important. Their presence is crucial. Their lack of presence will be not only a loss for the region, but will be dangerous. Because there will no longer be that edifying presence and witness. If we look at what's happening now, it's not really Christian Muslim anymore. It is a certain sector of the community that has an ever-narrowing perspective of what is right and what is wrong. And as long as you do not fit within that narrow perspective, within that small mold, then not only are you disagreed with, because that's normal, we can all disagree. You no longer have a right to exist. Someone decides for you that your life suddenly means less, or actually is worthless. And that's why that shrinking mold, and I've said this time and time again, is going to put our Muslim brothers and sisters in a real problem. Because the conversation has to be internal. I can't speak to someone who uses particular references to justify what he is doing and tell him it's wrong. That conversation has to be internal. There needs to be an addressing of the modus operandi the ethos, the understanding. Why are you doing this? If it's because it's due to a certain understanding, then it needs to be challenged and said, well, actually, this isn't really a part of it. Or if it is there, there must be a nuanced and revised reading of what that means in the 21st century. How can we go back to beheadings? If this had happened a thousand years ago, it would have been barbaric. Now it is just inexplicable. It is inconceivable. We have regressed a thousand years. We have people burnt alive. A poor Jordanian pilot who was fulfilling his duty was burnt alive and then buried probably while he was still breathing. How could anything or anyone justify that? Girls abducted in Africa. Women and girls sold into slavery today. 
we're talking about these new bills and laws against slavery, against human trafficking. Yet it's being done. Human beings are bought and sold. How can that happen today? The world community needs to realize that it has a responsibility and an ob obligation to address these issues. In the book of Genesis, we have a famous struggle between two brothers, and one kills the other. And then God calls to the brother who's still alive and says, where's your brother? His immediate answer is, am I my brother's keeper? Well, actually, yes. We are the keepers of our brothers and our sisters. We have that obligation and that responsibility. Those of you who have visited London and visited Westminster Abbey, or when you go next time, there is a beautiful monument just outside to the left as you walk in. And it is a monument to the unknown victim. And there is an inscription around it, and it's actually placed in one of the busiest corners of London, intentionally. The inscription around it says, all those who walk by, what is it to you? All those who walk by, what is it to you? We cannot walk by persecution. We cannot walk by what we see today as humans. This is such a wonderful initiative because it brings us together. There are too many fragmented voices, and fragmented voices bring fragmented results. Because we may all be speaking to the same person, but getting very small messages across. But powerful voices, collaborative voices, organized voices are imperative. I'm not a politician, thank heavens. What I do feel that I am, though, is an advocate. As a clergyman, as a bishop, as a Christian, we're all advocates. We walk in the light of what our Lord has asked us to do. He said that he has come to preach the gospel to the poor, to heal the broken heart, to proclaim liberty to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed in the Gospel of St. Luke. That is who we are as Christians. That is what we do. That is what we're supposed to be doing in this world. We need to continue to be advocates to the truth. Because the truth will not only set us free, the truth will set the world free. And this concept of collaboration and solidarity is precisely what it is for us as Christians, as the body of Christ. I don't ever feel distinct from any other Christian in the world, regardless of denomination. I know it's cliche and I know we've heard, all heard it, but what we have in common far exceeds what separates us. Even if all we have in common is the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ as the incarnate word and the manifestation of truth. If we believe in that, that's all we need. To be advocates of that truth. It's not all grim though. We out here feel it. But when you speak to Christians in the Middle East, yes, they're in pain. Yes, they need help. Yes, they're agonizing, but you sense a defiance. We are a resilient bunch. It, it, it takes a lot to overcome a Christian because we have hope. 
In the, gospel, in, in the book of Exodus 3, 7, God speaks of, of, of his captive people and he says, I have, surely been, I have surely seen the oppression of my people. I have heard their cry and I know their sorrows. And that's, we know that. We understand. I want to conclude with two statements. One from someone called Ken Curtis, who spoke of the early church. And he said, on the surface, the early Christians appeared powerless and weak. They were easy targets of scorn and ridicule. And he goes on to say, but what finally mattered is not what they did not have, but what they had. And what did they have? They had a faith. They had a fellowship. They had a new way of life. They had a confidence. And he goes on to say, these were the important things that made the difference of laying the Christian foundation for Western civilization. These were the same people who died, and those people are doing that today as well. I don't believe in this whole East-West, Western Christianity, or Christian West and, and Muslim world. The Muslim world title is a wrong one, because it means we have no place in it. This is not a Muslim world. There is a place where there is a Muslim majority, but it is a place of indigenous Christians. Final word, as always, to Scripture. 2 Corinthians 4. If you speak to Christians in the Middle East, and they do need our help, they need our help either with aid now, some of them need to get out, some of them need to be supported where they are. That is their decision. We need to stop making that decision for people. We need, to place, we need to stop placing ourselves with the entitlement of telling people that they should stay in the Middle East because otherwise it would be void without them or they should all leave because we're worried about them. They make their own choices. The scenario in Egypt and Lebanon is very different to the current scenario in Iraq and Syria and Libya. What we do need to do is to support them in the way they need to be supported. But if you speak to them, I think you will hear the same resonance of St. Paul. We are hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. This is the witness of our brothers and sisters. This is their daily testimony. Because they, like us, know that they must follow the scripture understanding of whenever they're asked, whenever they're addressed, to be able to give an account for the hope that is in them. And that hope is the same hope that brought us into this world, the same hope that came to save us, and the same hope that promises salvation even till today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Monsignor Angelos. Thank you very much for your words and for bringing to us the voice of your community. And thank you very much, especially because we are aware that after the martyrdom of the 21 brothers, uh, it's quite difficult, it's difficult to leave your land and come to the West. Because sometimes it may seem as if you're turning your back to you, your brothers in faith, even though they are physically very far. 
However, we are very united in our prayers. The blood shed by the martyrs is the foundations for new Christians everywhere. And these martyrs, our brothers, I am sure will be will bear fruit in the future. Maybe we can't imagine it right now, but I'm sure that in the future the heroic martyrdom of our brothers will translate into stronger communities, into a new way of living faith, etc. You have said that we have to love our enemies. This is something that uh, shocks me because it's, I find it quite difficult uh, to state this. I understand it, but how can we put this into practice? How can we love those who are killing our brothers and sisters? When our Lord told us to, to love our enemies, um, he did it because he knew that's how he was going to, to help us most. Anger, hatred, is crippling. It is actually, it, it, it takes our life away as Christians. Whenever I speak to our own young people or, or people who are, who are witnesses to these matters, I ask them, you know, what's the worst thing a radical can do to you? It's not kill you, because as we saw with these 21 men and so many like them, taking their life is just part of their journey. The worst thing that these people can do is make you hate them, because once they make you hate them, they have overcome you and defeated you. So yes, if we think with our human minds, then it's very difficult. But God sends us, I think, a very special piece. I, I remember as soon as I heard the confirmation that these 21 had died, I, I, I confirmed with Cairo, and I sent out my first tweet. And at the end of it, I put a hashtag of Father Forgive, because that's what I really felt. That's, it, it's, and instantly, I think so many people said that just comforted them. If we lead people down the road of anger and resentment, we pollute, we pollute them. We pollute their hearts and their minds. We have to be examples to our people of love and of faith and forgiveness. It was the model of our Lord on the cross when he prayed to the Father there and then to forgive those who crucified him and those who abandoned him. As I said, with the human mind, it doesn't make sense. But... And, and call me an idealist, and I'm really sorry. As a, as a bishop, if I wasn't an idealist, that'd be a real problem. But, but you know, as, as, as an idealist, um, that's, it's what we have to do. And we have to battle against ourselves if we can't do it. Thank you very much. You know very well Europe. And there are some people that are starting to talk about ways of persecution also in Europe or about a cutdown on freedoms. In our case, in fact, in a special uh, manner. The radical Islamic attacks uh, come, but also from sec- we suffer secular attacks too because they do not believe on our uh, beliefs and they show their intolerance by attacking Christians by you know, making us look uh, stupid on the media, showing priests as horrible people that try to cut down on freedoms. And in some cases in Spain, for instance, people, priests, have been attacked and not only insulted and spat at, but actually attacked, physically attacked. What do you think about this? As Christians, we will always have a counter-cultural message. That it's just, it's, we've been told. We've been told in Scripture that we will even look, appear to be fools for Christ. So if that foolishness is the truth, then it doesn't matter. I think the responsibility, though, is sometimes 
we don't live as faithfully as we should. We don't live as powerfully as we should. We react to others, but we don't proactively live our faith. I think the world is now looking for truth. We've gone through the decadent 80s, and we've gone through the 90s, and we've gone through the financial busts recently, and people are really looking for truth. If we were to provide a truth in the world as Christians, and you know, I've, so many of us are preoccupied, well, let's have the same Easter. Forget the same Easter, forget the same Christian, forget the same Christmas. Let's just advocate for truth and justice together. If we can present this united voice for truth and justice everywhere in the world, within our own communities nearby and throughout, when our Lord spoke to his disciples in Acts 1.8, he said to them to witness to him in Jerusalem, Samaria, Judea, and the ends of the earth. And so we need to witness on all of those fronts, and there are, there are enough of us to do it. And God gives different people different strength and different talents to do it. People here advocate internationally. Others will advocate very regionally in their own street or in their own neighborhood. We need to be proactive in taking down the negative view of Christianity. Sometimes it's because of our own lack of wisdom, but sometimes because we confuse Christian weakness with, with being meek. So rather than being meek and humble, we sit back and we're weak and we don't react in a positive, proactive, healthy way. I think the, the final thought on that as well is that a very good friend of mine, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, um, Rowan Williams, wrote an article a few months ago talking about persecution in the West. And he said, please don't use the word lightly. I, we can't use persecution with what happens to us here in the same breath as what's happening in, in Iraq and Syria and Egypt and, and, and everywhere else. We, we face struggles. We, we face difficulties. But let's not use those, those two scenarios in the same breath because I think it, it diminishes what people are going through for their faith today. Yes, thank you very much. Many jihadists are Europeans. Why? Why do you think that happens? I'm tired of hearing it's because people are disenfranchised and marginalized and poor. There are millions of disenfranchised, marginalized, and poor people in Europe. They don't all become radicalized. Um, I don't think we can justify it in that way anymore. I think there are real issues within the communities from where these young men and now young women come, and it needs to be addressed. Um, if I thought one of my own young people was going to, to go anywhere in the world and fight for a Christian militia, I would do everything in my power to change this person's mind because it would be wrong ethically as far as I was concerned. But the fact that as, as, as Western communities now and governments, and even within their own communities, this is being justified by the fact that these were very poor victims of societies, they, I'm sure they may be victims. And I, I am not diminishing at all people's suffering within their own communities. There are people who are poor in the West that should not be poor. There are people suffering injustice in the West that should not be suffered. And marginalization and, and else. That should be fixed. But I think that is very different to the radicalization issue. Yes, these people may be vulnerable and therefore taken and radicalized. But I don't think there are very there are some very honorable and respectful and respectable poor people in the world. And they have their ethics, they have their morals. And you know, I, I, I go on a humanitarian trip with some people every year, and we see some of the most underprivileged people being the most beautiful people you've ever met. So poverty is not an excuse. Poverty may be a reason, and of course injustice must be addressed. But I think it is deeper than that and that deeper issue needs to be addressed internally. To finish, I would just like 
to ask for a message for, to, for, uh, or send out a message to Christians asking how we can help them in the West, more specifically in Spain, more specifically here in this room. Me, myself, I would like to know what I can do. How can I help my brethren? Please keep the issue alive. Um, the media now is very fickle. The media now moves from one issue to the next very quickly. Yesterday's news becomes yesterday's news very quickly. And if you see it on your televisions and, and in your newspapers, the world moves very quickly. So the more we keep the issue alive, and it doesn't have to be artificial. There are things happening tragically every day. So if we just keep people informed, I must say that the um, Citizen Go program, the, um, the minute that we had the killing of the 21 cops in Libya, um, whoever's responsible for this, my, my executive assistant and my office thanks you very much because her email crashed three times. Because there was an online petition that was set up and she instantly had thousands of emails in her, in her box, addressed to me and to our community in a very short space of time. That kind of mobilization is essential. It is, it is very, very good. The fact that we speak for each other and we speak against injustice, wherever it might happen, is important. But as we've heard time and time again, while this is happening generally in the Middle East, the, the vast majority of it, the brunt of it, falls squarely on Christians because they are numeric minorities, but they also are, to these people, a very natural enemy. They see them as a natural enemy. They see them as natural prey. And so I, I would say, please keep them in your prayers first and foremost because we have seen miracles happening in the Middle East over the past few months that we just can't explain. Egypt was a miracle, and where we are today is miraculous, and so on and so forth. So pray for them, but also keep the issue alive, keep advocating, keep speaking to your legislators to keep the issue alive, and remember to look for their needs. Immediate needs now, advocacy and advocating for them, whether it be supporting them where they are, creating safe space for them, or actually propagating for them to be taken into asylum and other places, and leave the decision to them. But whatever they ask for, we need to stand by their side. Thank you very much for everything.